Mulweni, Siani Bona, Tumilang, Chobela, Absheni, Huinant. Good evening. Uh, my name is Wile Manoi, and I work as the head of science engagement at the South African Astronomical Observatory. I will be your host uh, this evening. On behalf of SciFest Africa and the South African Astronomical Observatory, I wish to extend a warm word of welcome to everyone. We are meeting in the middle of World Space Week and during National Astronomy Month to celebrate our astronomical heritage. This event is part of an online or virtual uh, science festival that's organized by SciFest and is starting now in October. It's going to run online till March next year. It is also a precursor uh, for the celebrations of the 200 years of existence of the observatory in, uh, in, in, in Cape Town. So to, to, to celebrate our, our astronomical heritage, I think we need to recognize that all the people in the world have a relationship uh, with the stars and they have used stars for various purposes. Uh, including developing calendars, regulating their ceremonies, uh, for navigation, for storytelling. African people are no exception. They also have a deep and profound relationship with the stars, and they have used stars for various purposes. And uh, to, to, to appreciate the importance of our heritage, I think we're going to show you a video on African cultural astronomy, what it is and why it is important. Do you know how to dream if you do not look at the dreamland? And that dreamland is the sky. We use the stars to tell the time for initiation, for agricultural cycles, and many other things. I have a radical thought that Africa is the birth of scientific thought. Being the cradle of mankind, we were the first to get that connection with the night sky. Unfortunately, many of our rich information went into grave with our forefathers, not documented. Indigenous knowledge, in particular in Africa, is a knowledge that has been not documented. It's a knowledge that has been transferred from one generation to another generation. Indigenous knowledge is in oral histories, it's in the spoken word, in song. It's the knowledge that is learned through observation. The stories that are told that come from the African continent about stars, the suns, the moon, any story was born out of people wanting to explain and interpret the happenings and the cultures and the, the realities that they observed around them. When one accesses indigenous storytelling and song, one will find the scientific history. I think it's important for young South Africans to be exposed to astronomy. Once they are exposed to astronomy, I think they do develop critical minds. Many, many young people in our country or the continent or the world are facing situations where they are stuck and they feel like nothing good will ever happen in my life. Astronomy inspires curiosity and encourages a culture of questioning and thinking. When you look at the metaphor of um, what it means when people say look up to the stars, they don't mean wait until the sun sets and then the stars come out and then you look up. It's not about stargazing, it's about taking yourself out of a difficult situation and look to the stars and see what possibilities are out there and knowing that I'm not stuck here forever. So there's actually a lot of creativity 
and opportunities that are there, but the really big thing is to engage. I really want to implore young people to look at this path as an amazing place to look to the future, to open a door and go to a place you never thought even existed. And once you get there, there's so much you can do to contribute to rebuilding the, the, the pride, the, the, the dignity of the African continent. The knowledge of indigenous astronomy is the key to be opening all of these uh, wonderful wisdoms. And once they possess them, there's no stopping them. Bring astronomy to people so that they can dream more. Bring astronomy to people so that they can be enlightened with the old wisdom and the new science. And by doing so, we will be enhanced holistically. Look up to the stars and there's no stopping the dreams that we can have or the desire to achieve in whatever professions we choose. I think that's where we need to be in our country right now or in our continent because once you know how powerful you are, you have no desire to be like anybody else. You. Stars and starlights have, over the years and centuries, been a source of inspiration, imagination, and innovation. No wonder we have such big telescopes as the Southern African Large Telescope, and we are building uh, towards the square kilometer array. But this did not begin now. It's got its own history which is captured in, Afri in, in indigenous astronomy. We have a special guest today who is going to share through song, through poetry, through storytelling, the power and the relevance of indigenous astronomy. Our guest is Dr. Trina Thorpe. She's a world acclaimed and multi award-winning storyteller, actor, playwright, author, and the leading professional storyteller in the world. She has produced many storytelling combat discs, including the award-winning Fuduka's Magic, and has written many books, including the award-winning Stories of Africa book. In recognition of her storytelling, uh, expert, expertise and also her performance. She has received many, many awards. I'll name a few. The BBC Award, the Fringe First Award in Edinburgh, the Geoff Jefferson Award in Chicago, and she's also re received an honorary doctorate from Open University in the United Kingdom. Dr. Trinam Sop has performed at many international uh, festivals, both science and cultural festivals. She has facilitated many training workshops on storytelling. She has facilitated public debates and has been promoting storytelling as an art form. We all know that the, the indigenous knowledge has been transferred from one generation to another through storytelling. Help me welcome our guest today, the powerful and the inspirational Dr. Trinam Sope. Sanbonani, 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 it is said, it is a darkest night that makes you see the brightest stars in the night sky. 
we are living in 2020, it has been a difficult year in many, many ways of looking at it. No matter where you are standing, it's been so difficult, it's been so dark in many people's lives, but difficult years like these force us to remember, to dig deep and find what is strong inside us. And one of those strengths is through our creative arts. We in the creative arts are healers as well. And as we are healing through song, through poetry, through stories, you remember many, many people who came before us. And those who came before us, I remember a woman like Bessie Head who said, when she was asked how she thought the revolution will come in South Africa, she said, it is impossible to guess how it will come. But in a world where all ordinary people are fighting for their rights, it is inevitable. But it is also to be hoped that great leaders will arise. And she said, it is also to be hoped that Southern Africa might one day become the home of the storyteller and dreamer who did not hurt others, but only introduced new dreams that fill the heart with wonder, new dreams that fill the heart with wonder. When we try to fill the heart with wonder, you cannot shine a light on another person without that light coming back to you as well. I wish to shine a light and honor each and every one of you. You are the stars above the African sky. A very, very long time ago, when the world was young, the sun and the moon were married. They lived in a beautiful place in the center of the African continent. And in their home, they lived with their children. Many, many, many children, hundreds of thousands of children. And they all looked alike. They used to shine and shimmer and twinkle when their mother, the moon, and their father, the sun, looked with so much love to them. And these children, they were all called by one name. It was not Nombuso. It was not Tembekile, it was not Tolile, it was not Depuo or Mpo or Katleho or Mulalo. No, 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 no. They didn't call them James or Catherine. They called them Izzy, Agnesi, Pinaledi, Stars. And this name suited each and every one of these children. They lived a beautiful life. Ha! The mother, the moon, was very gentle serene and that beauty oh my goodness she used to glow when her husband looked at her with so much love and the sun he was hot mm -hmm. he was passionate he was adventurous and he loved traveling to see what's going on over there what's going on over there all over the world he tried to find out what's happening and he would come back home and sit with his children and his wife and tell them all that he had seen and then the following time, he'd travel again over the mountains, across, beyond that big forest. He continued exploring. Woo, Mr. Adventure! He'd come back hot, 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 excited to tell them what he had seen. And this happened all the time, and the children couldn't wait for their father to come back home. All those stars would be shining and leading him home. And you would tell them everything in detail with such enthusiasm. One day, the sun traveled further, much further than he had traveled before. And what do you know? He spotted somebody. Uh, was it something? Was it somebody? Oh, it was a woman. She, she was large. She was shimmering. She had such rhythm. And the way she moved. Hey, bro, how come I've never seen this? How come? Oh, my goodness. Whoosh. Wash you are. Wash, wash you are. He came closer and he said, Who are you? Where have you been? How come I've never seen you before? <laughs> I don't know what you mean when you say you've never seen me before. I've been watching you traveling all over the sky. I have seen you. You're a busy man, aren't you? I am ocean, Uluanle. I am ocean and I have been here since the beginning of time. So I don't know what you mean when you say you've never seen me before. And you know what? The children of Luanle, the ocean, were living inside her body. 
when they saw this very, very hot, adventurous man, they came closer. Ooh, the whales were jumping and looking, and a big spray went up into the sky. And then dolphins were hopping out of the water, looking at the sun. Ooh, they would giggle back under the water. And turtles came closer. That's what Peggy says. And then they went back into the water. Different creatures, some of them were very shy. They went back inside. <laughs> the son was awed. He was mesmerized by all of this. He had no idea there was a woman called Ocean with all of her children living inside her body. This was something. He said goodbye. He went back home to tell his wife and children what he had seen, who he had met. He said, my wife, you can't believe it. She is large. She has got rhythm. And the way she moves is something else. And then the children in her body he went on and on explaining. And the moon said, mm-hmm. Yeah, boy. Uh-huh. <laughs> he kept on explaining in detail. And the, the moon only, only said, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And that was that. The following day, the sun went to visit the ocean again. And they talked, and he looked at the way she moved, and he met more of her children. And then he said, you know what? I have got a beautiful wife as well. Her name is Moon. And the ocean says, yes, I know. I know. I have seen her up there as well. <laughs> this happened quite often, the sun coming to visit the ocean, until one day he said, you know something? I think it's time you come and visit me at my home. I'm the one who comes to visit you all the time. Why don't you come and visit? You can meet my children as well. They are beautiful. We call them stars. You must come and visit. The ocean said, tell me, how big is your house? Very large woman, as you can see. Woo! The, 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 the ocean was, was not joking either. <laughs> the sun said, okay, okay, I get you. I'll go back home. We will make sure that our house is big enough. Then I'll come and fetch you. Well, the ocean said, I'll be waiting. And he went over. He rushed home and said to his wife, my wife, I have invited the ocean. Please, let's prepare our house. And they got started. Beautifying the house, everybody helping. The house was huge. And then they prepared some food all kinds of food in pots and pots and potfuls. It was all over the place and drinks. And then when they were ready, the sun went over and said, Ocean, we are ready for you. Come on over. Ocean said, I'm on my way. And whoosh, and whoosh, she came following the sun over the mountains, whoosh, over the hills, whoosh, ah, filling the, the forest. She kept on flowing and flowing and crossing more rivers, places that were not rivers yet. And as the, the ocean was getting closer and closer over that mountain, the moon looked and thought, oh, Mosia, where, baby? She is massive. She is massive. I cannot believe this. <laughs> he said, she said to the husband, Baba, may we please um, uh, give her food right in front of the house because there's no way she can fit into this house. She is almost arriving, but she's still coming over there. The sun was, how can we do that? We invited her. She is our guest. We cannot ask her to eat outside. So he pushed his wife aside and he stood in front of him. Ocean, please come in, come in. We, 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 we've been waiting for you. Oh my goodness. She came, whoosh into the house, whoosh into the house. There was a whale, there was a dolphin, there was a crocodile. All of these children were feeling the house. And the house just could not stand that forth and all of that water and all the food that had been prepared was as filled with salty water and they were hum, 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 eating and finishing everything and the walls mm, 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 the walls mm, 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 there was no house to talk about the moon what did i say what did i say she told the children all the stars asambin let's go and the stars, all of them followed their mother, going higher and higher in the sky. And when they were up, 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 up there, they could see other planets. And, and oh my, what a place. Mother, why have we never, ever come here before? This is amazing. This is outstanding. They were so happy. You cannot believe it. 
And they said, Mama, when is father coming? And the woman said, the woman said, don't talk to me about that one. Don't talk to me about that one. <laughs> and the children went exploring, enjoying the new place they had discovered. And they traveled for a long time until they were too tired. It had been a very eventful day. And they fell asleep. The moon and the stars were all there. At this time, the ocean had messed up everything and she was going back home. And some of the water that remained in places that would soon become rivers and lakes and springs and fountains and, 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 and paddle and, and, and places like, a, like um, swamps. And she was going and going back to the place that is still ocean even today. Well, the son was worried. He was thinking, oh, I accept my wife. She's not going to accept me anymore. Oh, I've got to compose a nice poem. I've got to find good words to, to, to speak to her so that she knows I love her. I never stopped loving her. <laughs> he went higher and higher and higher. He saw the other planets, but he was looking for his wife, for his children. They were far from him. He looked and looked, and he too was tired after such a busy, busy day. And he fell asleep. As soon as the sun fell asleep, the moon and the stars woke up. You just missed us. And then they floated this way and that way. What a wide, wide atmosphere out there. What an unbelievable place to discover. And they went on and on until finally they too were tired. They fell asleep. And the sun woke up and he looked and he couldn't find them. He was shining hotter and brighter with love. And this is what happened. It was the daytime. The sun was looking for his wife and children. And when they fell asleep, it was nighttime. The stars and the moon were floating and discovering new places up, up, up out there. Oh, my goodness. It happened like this day and night and day and night. It was painful, though. The moon was used to having her husband next to her, loving her cherishing her, honoring her, and the children used to shine even more when their father was near. After some time, they decided they needed to be together. You can't help that kind of love and do nothing about it. And so the sun, the moon, and many, many years later, decided they needed to come together and they had to kiss and embrace. And because there were humans at this time, and humans, you know how curious human beings are. I am a polar, they want to see everything. They decided when they kiss, they draw a curtain. And this human beings gave us a name, gave it a name too. They called it solar eclipse or lunar eclipse. <laughs> the sun and the moon were loving each other. And every single time when they wanted to be together, they did this to block all those curious eyes from human beings. But when they were traveling and exploring and helping everything to grow and helping lost people to find their way wherever they were going, they did what they loved most, shining brighter and brighter with so much love and passion and raising wisdom and making everyone believe and understand that everyone has a right to be here because every star in the sky speaks to every heart of every human being here on earth. So, so see, Iapela, that's where I rest that story. You know, when we tell stories like these, when we talk about the wisdoms of our people who made stories to explain things they did not understand. But also, when we pray to the Almighty, we talk about stars. When I started telling stories, especially when I went into full-time storytelling, I used to sing, Sibaga, baga, langa, nyanga, mshaba, no
to tell the story, to tell the story and bring back respect to our culture. You speak to all these celestial beings because they are connected with the Almighty, the creator of all things. But when Christianity first came to South Africa, you know, there were different people accepting, they were becoming um, Lutherans, they were becoming um, Methodists, the Wesleyans, they were becoming Roman Catholic Church. There was a man, a Tasa speaking man, Unsegana Takaba. He decided he needed songs that don't sound like I'm gonna die anytime now and I'm, I'm, I'm such a sinner and I'm not worthy. We celebrate the Almighty and he wanted something that speaks to Isiqui. The rhythm of African people, because this rhythm is what we were born with. Talking to his creator, Ungulumulu, Umvelinangi, Usomandla, Mudimu, Mudimu, Ungai. That is how, that is how we pray. We bring this joy when we pray. And uh, many people have never even heard the name Unsegana. He's one of our ancestors that we celebrate so much. When Unsegana said, Utikomkulu, the Almighty, who created all the stars and the sun, the moon, the earth, who created even us people, and there is a part where he says, Watala Nemfama. Even the, the blind ones, the blind people, he deliberately made them. Every single person, every one of us, we are unique, we are different, we are outstanding. There is nobody else like you. There's nobody else like me. We have got every right to be here. You know, when we look at stars, when we look at the earth where we live, and some people look at darkness as a curse. Sometimes in the darkness, you have to work so hard to search for light. And when we search for light as the people of the African continent, particularly in times like 2020, under COVID-19, we have to awaken that spirit of hope because the hope is the light that shines inside each and every one of us. When we wake up that spirit of hope, there's something that happens. You can't have that spirit of hope without being, with it be, becoming infectious to other people. That is why then, the next story I'm gonna tell you, it is a story about a village that was up on a hill. And in this village, there lived people in the village of Emoyeni, people who loved hunting. Their hunting team was well known all over. 
People respected their hunters. They had learned a lot from the indigenous people of South Africa, the ones who hunt with a bow and arrow, the ones who know how to track, how to read the writing on the floor, on the dust, even in the desert when animals had passed. These are the first peoples, the Khoi, the sand of our people. These are the ones that you see in our faces. I have been asked once, how come you're so light in complexion? What is the story with your cheekbones? What is the story with your small eyes? It's the first people. It's because I bear resemblance to the first peoples of South Africa. You see, this story is called Sunset Colors. Once there was a boy called Temba. Temba lived in a village called Emoyeni, up with the place where the wind blows. Up in this village, the people who were such great, great hunters, they also loved telling stories. You see, when they came back from their hunting trips, they came back with meat, with um, with um, skins that they could use for clothing, for, for blankets to cover themselves on winter nights, but also they told stories of all the trips, all their journeys and their adventures. <laughs> no different from the sun. What do you think? <laughs> now. This boy, Temba, he was short, he was small in build. Temba loved making pictures. He had a special gift. He could take clay and make it small containers, make small containers and dry them. And then he would take flowers, wild berries, and some leaves, crush them, crush them and make different colors and put them water into these clay pots. Sometimes he took certain stones and rubbed them until there's a brilliant red. And sometimes there'll be something like woo, midnight blue and he'd put it in there and he would make all these different colors. Then he took sticks and crushed them, with a stick, crushed them until they look like they're little brushes. And he would take the inside of a bark of a tree and he would ask a friend of his, please, Stand right here. I want to make a portrait of you. And his friends laughed and they didn't know what he was talking about, but they sat still. And he took the sticks and dipped them in the wet paint and he made a portrait. And he was so good at it. When he was finished, he would show to the other children. Oh, they could not believe. They were awed by his skill. He could make paintings of all kinds. And so Temba did this, but he thought to himself, I'm doing this in the meantime because I want to be one of the best hunters this village of Emoeni has ever seen. It's a matter of time until I'm also tall and strong and the leader of the hunting team will call me. He will sit with my parents. He will ask for permission to take me with the hunting team of Emoeni. What a proud day that will be. But in the meantime, he made all of these clay pots and then he made the different colors of paint and then he made portraits of his friends. Even adults were wondering, how did this boy know how to do that beautiful work? Until he was 12 years old, he was still short and small. When he was 14, he was still short and small. He didn't like it one bit. When he mentioned to the other boys that one day he wanted to be the best hunter the village of Emoeni ever saw, they laughed at him. <laughs> Where's good to your time? You, Temba, so short and so small. How on earth are you going to join our proud, strong hunters of the village of Emoyeni? He was so offended one day when the boys laughed at him again that he went to his father and he sat down. Pap, what is wrong with me? Why am I not growing? I want to be big and tall and strong. I want to be the best hunter this village has ever seen. I want the leader of the hunting team to call me, to take me with him. His father sat down and said, Temba, am I big? Am I strong? Uh, no, Bob. Um, am I the best hunter you've ever seen? No, Bob. But I still wish to believe that you love and respect me, my son. Yes, Father, I do love and respect you. But, but, but the other boys are laughing at me and I want to be the best hunter. And he grumbled and grumbled and marched out of the house. He went down towards the river. He crossed and went to the other hill over there. And he sat by himself, feeling 
so sorry for himself. And the hunters had gone far away somewhere. And as he sat there looking at the grasslands, he saw down at the valley at the river. You know, when you've got an eye for color, an eye for, you notice many things. And the sun was getting ready to set. It is the time when my people say, that golden, beautiful afternoon light in the afternoon, we call it the time of the beautiful people. Even I am good looking at that time. <laughs> and Temba looked at the water, at the river. It looked like liquid gold flowing down. And he saw the different uh, colors of the flowers and the leaves. They were reflecting in the golden light of the setting sun. And then he looked up. Oh my, my, what a sunset. The colors were rust and yellow and orange. And it was out of this world. He was so impressed by what he saw until he looked. There was a cloud. Okay, there was a cloud coming. It was a big cloud coming lower and lower. It was floating towards him. And on the cloud, there were two people sitting on the cloud, like it was some cushion. It was an old man with white, white hair and a white beard. And then next to him was a beautiful young woman coming towards him. Luckily, they were smiling. He held onto the grass. He was hoping with all his heart that they were going to go to float right past him and go to wherever they were going. He waited and waited, his heart beating so hard, beating so hard like drums. And then they stopped right in front of him. And they said to him, Temba, like your name, which means hope. You are the hope of your people. You must use it. Take this skin. They took a beautifully tanned animal skin. It was as soft as velvet and they handed it over to him. They had rolled it up. They said, Temper, take this. Make the colors of the sunset on this skin. You are the hope of your people. You can do this. He accepted the skin, smiling, mesmerized. And as they were receding, they were singing, Temba, when I Temba, Unasipiwo, Sisebenzisa, Uli Temba, this is with Sako. Temba, when I Temba, Unasipiwo, Sisebenzisa, Uli Temba, this is with Sako. They disappeared in the night. He took that skin and he ran down the hill. And as he was running, he was looking at the different stars. He knew the way they were configured that they always could guide you home. And he went down to the river and he climbed up and the stars were shaping themselves, aligning him so that he knows exactly where his home was. And when he got back home, he took that skin, put it away. It was his secret. He could hardly fall asleep that night. <laughs> he was so excited. He did not tell anybody. He could hardly fall asleep. He was thinking, I'm going to make that sunset. I saw it. It was unbelievable. The following day, he took an old skin. He thought he would practice on something that um, was not the one they gave to him. And then he took his colors and he tried. Oh, that looked terrible. And then he tried another one. The following day, it looked all wishy-washy, like somebody had thrown like some dirty dish water. He was so upset. Every single time he tried, it didn't work out. He thought, what is wrong with me? Huh? It looks like I'm not good at anything. I thought I was going to grow tall and strong. I'd be the best hunter this village of MON had ever seen. Now I'm not a good hunter. Nobody wants anything to do with me. And then these people believed in me. They brought a beautiful skin for me to make the colors of their sunset like I saw them the other night. Now I'm failing. I'm useless. I don't even deserve it. You know what I think? They came to the wrong village. That's right. They came to the wrong timber. I must take the skin all the way back to the hill. I must sit there and wait for them to return. I'll hand over the skin. It's okay, I am no good. I'm the useless timber. And as he was thinking this, he was walking up the hill. He was walking up and he sat there, his heart sinking. Oh, it was painful, painful. 
And then he was wishing for them to return when the colors of the sunset began, began to configure in the western sky. They were exquisite, like nothing he had ever seen in all his young life. I'm stupid indeed. There must be mud in my head. I should have brought colors. How am I going to paint the colors of the sunset? I am here. The skin is here. And I've got nothing to paint with. What is wrong with you, Temba? And as he was busy, conf confused, and then, and then saying terrible things to himself, the old man and his daughter or the young woman came towards him, smiling again. They were holding big clay pots. And in those clay pots, there were sticks. They had been crushed. They were full of juicy, wet paint. It was like a bouquet of colors, an explosion of colors. And they handed over to him. They said, Temba, you are the gift of your people. Go on, paint the colors of the sunset. It is your gift. And Temba accepted those big potfuls of paint and he put them down next to him. Ngiabonga, ngiabonga. Thank you so much, ngiabonga. And he opened the skin and he began to work as fast as he could. He was painting like a madman. He didn't want to lose the light. He didn't want the sun to set before he was done. And they were singing, When temba, unesipiwo, se seven zise, uli temba, When he was done, he knew he couldn't see much, but he had to hold it very carefully and walk down, down the hill and up, up on the other side of the river, all the way home. When he got back home, he said to his mother, mother, look what I have done. His mother said, my son, I cannot see anything. The fire cannot make enough light for me to see what you have done. Wait until tomorrow morning. And he thought, oh, mama, maybe my father can see better. He called his father. His father said the same thing. Wait until tomorrow morning, my son. With the bright light of the morning, we can see everything you have done. What a disappointment. He's grown up. He put his paint away, painting away. He didn't want anything to happen to it. They had supper. He tried to fall asleep. He was giggling to himself. <laughs> he was so happy. His heart was so exploding with so much joy. And he was hearing that song. He was hearing this song like a lullaby. He was floating on a cloud until finally he fell asleep. In the morning, he was the first one to jump up. He wanted to see where the painting was. He grabbed it and said, Mama, wake up. It's morning. Please wake up. When she woke up and rubbed her eyes and saw what her son had done, she ran outside and called the neighbors or her friends. Hey, don't you say I never tell you when wonderful things happen in my family. Come, see for yourself. And the women came, and soon the men as well were hearing all this commotion. Temba's father saw. He went and called his friends as well. Men, women, different people in the village were rushing to Temba's home. Other people were thinking, oh, what has happened now? There must be some tragedy. Why is everyone rushing there now? When they got there, they looked. Some of the men were saying, Ma me shane. What is this? It's like this young man has taken a big knife and he cut the evening sky last night and he put it on this animal skin. We've never seen anything like this ever. He is brilliant. And they praised him and praised him. Somebody had run to call the chief of the village. The chief of the village came walking slowly and he let his hand with his hands behind his back. He arrived at Temba's home. They brought him a, a stool for him to sit. And when he was sitting there, he looked at the work Temba had done and he nodded. He only had one thing to say. Young man, make a portrait of me. He had to jump. Enough for all of this praising and praising, accepting compliments. He had to quickly get another skin, quickly get his pots of, of clay and put colors inside. And then he started making a portrait of the old man. 
It was beautiful. When he had done, and the elder sat down. And more and more people were coming. And one old woman said, Hi, Bao. She hardly had any teeth left. And in December, Chamber was working over time, making portraits of old men and old women. And this is what he did every day until the leader of the hunting team could be heard singing from far away, coming home. And they were told, Go to Chamber's home. That's where everybody's gathering. That's where it's happening. And when they arrived, they brought meat, they brought the skins that they were laid out to dry. And then they listened to what they were told about this young boy. And they said, maybe we should tell you the stories of our journey, of our adventure, our hunting trip. And they told him everything. And he took different skins that were brought and he was busy painting. The stories, okay, look at the Dendrolamid. It's like he was there, like he saw that giraffe with his own two eyes. He, it was he that come with us everywhere we went, the river we crossed, and he was painting and painting, interpreting all these stories until the chief of the village said, You know what? This boy, we must give him the history of our people. And so they told him story after story about how they ended up in the place where the wind blows the village of Emoyeni, how they started becoming such good hunters. All their heroes and the sheroes of the land, they were talking about them. And the builders were busy building a huge round, 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 round hut. And they were going to put up all the paintings that Temba had made. When they had done all of that, they took them, they put them up on walls, they put them up on the walls. The chief was pleased indeed. The elders, oh my goodness, they were so proud of this young man. And the parents, I can't really begin to tell you, the joy inside them. They felt so, so blessed. And the boys, remember the ones who were laughing at him? Ha <laughs> you are useless. You must go play with girls. Hi, they were hiding. They were jealous, and some of them were envious. They were thinking, I wish I could draw like Temba. Young boys and girls were saying, if only I could be like him. When I grow up, I will know how to paint like, paint like with Temba. Temba grew up, he got married, he had children, and everybody celebrated him. They said he was short and small, and many people gave him a name, um -deng -deng -deng, the one who's tall on the sticks of his achievements. And Temba was respected. He did not need to be tall and strong. He did not need to be like anybody else. He needed to be himself. He surely was the hope of his own people. He interpreted the heritage, the history, all the journeys of his people going back in time. He was a star shining in his community. And Temba, that story of a man whose name means hope, inspires each and every one of us to know that we must play our role. Every single one of us, we've got a role to play to make a difference in the world we are living in. And so I wish to say you are the hope of your people. Make sure you never, never shy away from excelling in whatever profession, whatever gift that you've got. Make sure you are the one who does the very best because it is heart that separates the good from the great. Go on, shine like the stars. Shine, shine brighter and brighter and lead those who might be lost on their way home to know they are true Africans. There's no need to apologize. That's where I rest my story. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Mabutuna, for such inspirational, encouraging, and informing stories. I'm always inspired after hearing your stories. You know, I remember in Sutherland how you move people even though they couldn't understand the language, but they were in tears through the power of your storytelling. Here we have a number of positive remarks from the audience. You know, um, uh, Lucky Zamini says, this is very powerful. And we also have Sonia Rajameya, uh, who says she feels though she's connected through your storytelling to the greater universe. And uh, John Bingo, I'll select just a few comments. 
uh, and Tomigosi uh, to Sopu said, this is beautiful. And also I have some questions uh, for you, Mabutlina. Uh, we have Jawanda who says, I enjoy this. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uplifting from Sacha. So we've got lots of positive comments from the audience. Thank you so much from Maru for this moving story of life and the of life and the universe. So thank you, thank you to the audience for all these um, powerful and positive uh, comments. And I'm sure Mamutin appreciates all of them. Uh, thank you so much. Of course, Kalevoha. Thank you. <laughs> you know, when I first went into full-time storytelling. Um, uh, people in Johannesburg were worried about me. They thought I was having a, a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Other people wanted to help me. They used to say to me, hey, listen, man, you can talk to me if you've got problems. Don't worry, I can keep your secret. They thought something was definitely wrong with me. But for me, I felt that it was a calling. I felt like I had to respond to the call. I had been traveling all over the world and people were asking me to tell stories simply because I came from the African continent. But luckily, I had been brought up in a family where storytelling was the norm. And when I started doing storytelling and feeling that it was a calling, I left everything and focused only on storytelling. I realized that um, when you decide to, st to stop everything else and focus on something specifically, you, 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 you simply grow and grow. You can go back to doing whatever else you were doing before, but you need to just focus on this. It's like somebody who's learning to swim for the first time. You can't do mountain climbing and swimming at the same time. So you focus on the water. Whether it's a calling or not, you make sure that you focus on it as much as you can. And, and language is extremely important. For me, I'm happy to be speaking the three languages that I speak, and I use them. When I'm telling stories in Isizulu, I tell stories only in Isizulu. When I'm telling stories in Isikosa, I love Telling it in English, I tell. So all of those things are extremely important. Yes, there are people who are natural born storytellers, but there are people who learn and learn. Before you know it, they are shining. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mamutina. And the uh, friend also wanted to know, when did you decide uh, to do uh, storytelling professionally? At what point? When did you decide? It was 1991 when I decided to do full-time storytelling, and um, it felt like I have learned to fly. <laughs> mm. I promise you, it felt like I've grown wings and I've learned to fly. There was uh, nothing that ever fitted me so perfectly than storytelling. I was filled with such gratitude. And um, when I did storytelling, I discovered that um, I could compose songs I never knew that I could uh, compose um, songs. Uh, storytelling opened another valve in my heart that had music. Another thing as well that happened with storytelling is the flexibility of the art form. You tell stories to the very young ones, in, even if it's kindergarten. You go to primary school, you go to high school, you tell stories at university. I find that I tell stories in the corporate world telling stories to interpret certain concepts and, and, and strategies when they're having important uh, uh, team building conferences and they give me their briefing and I put those into storytelling idiom. So storytelling is one of the most versatile art forms and composing songs or running workshops to help people who want to start um, creating their own, um, uh, maybe they want to write a book, but they feel, it, I, I don't know, I just can't find my voice. Storytelling unlocks that voice. So I started in, in 1991 and I've never looked back. I formed an organization called Zanendaba. And also when we started with our literacy campaign, Nozimuaji, Mother of Books in 2001, storytelling was part and parcel of it because I can never be the Trinamklope who tells stories without the Trinamklope who writes books. It's always the two of us are one. And now my birthday is from the year when I turned 60 in 2018. I decided that my birthday should be known as National Storytelling Day. So this is my month. October 24th is my birthday. We shall be telling stories on the 24th of October because it is National Storytelling Day. Thank you so much, Mama. There are also there are lots of positive comments. Uh, I'll read a few. 
Uh, there's one from Cedric Jacob says, uh, from SAO say, thank you so much. This was great. This, uh, Steven also he says, Lo lovely way of weaving different cultures together with different languages. Ngozi, thank you so much. There's yeah. lots of them uh, from Carol Bowser, you know, from N. Vesebisekan. She says that she can even see the village of Emoyen. She can the picture village of Emoyen. Emoyen. She can picture well, the old blow. lady complaining. <laughs> Thank you so much, you go to the village. Sure there are, uh, yeah, there's so many positive comments. Uh, Siabonga from Anonymous, anonymous attendee. From Kemi, Ke Kelly Banat say, Ngozi Kakulu Mamutrina. Uh, Carol Bosa, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Uh, and then she asked, where did you grow up and what inspired you to tell stories? I grew up in two places. Um, uh, I grew up firstly in, in Hammersdale, which is here in Guazulu Natal. And uh, my grandmother was a master storyteller. So that's mm -hmm. where this whole thing was born. But I had no idea that I would become a storyteller. And then in my teenage years, I lived in the Eastern Cape. That's where I learned to speak Isitosa because I couldn't fit in. I thought I've got to learn this language and speak it well. So I went to town with learning to speak Isitosa and fell in love with the language. In fact, my first poetry or short stories were written in Isitosa. And now mm. I write in Isitosa, Isizulu and English. And I never knew that I could become a full-time storyteller. I thought I would be a writer. That's all. I just thought I'd write and I would live this well-behaved, quiet life. So I guess the Almighty was not imagining mm -hmm. a well-behaved, quiet freedom club. <laughs> we had to have this uh, joyous person that I am. And so I'm grateful that I was able to transcend into both a storyteller and a writer. Thank you so much, Mom. And there's also another message uh, from Maralise Nell. She says, may you and your stories continue to have wings that fly and reach lots of people, lifting them up. Thank you so much, Maralise. I'm not sure if there are any other questions coming uh, from the audience. So but I, I think I read all the questions that were there. I think I'll give this time for people to write on the chat if they have any questions. If they have any questions, they can write them on the chat. Okay, okay. Okay. One of the uh, things uh, that we any questions needed... that side. Okay, ma'am. One of the things that I think we, we, we need to do is um, raise more awareness about astronomy in South Africa or the African continent. Every single time you mention astronomy in many communities, people look, look at you like, what are you talking about now? Is this from one of your imagination places? And it's not imaginary, it's a very, very important uh, aspect of our lives. And um, we need to have more children of the African continent getting into this, uh, this profession and owning mm -hmm. it and, and finding pride, not only in where it comes from, but being part and parcel of where astronomy is going. Mm -hmm. And so through storytelling and, and, and other ways of, of, of encouraging uh, the, the awareness, we need to do this. It's a calling that we need to answer to. The stars are not only uh, out there for us to, to learn about them. I mean, you know about Usi Abule Yes. How many young people in South Africa have never heard of or ever heard of Usi Abule mm -hmm. When you tell them that there's a planet named after a young man from the Eastern Cape, Usi Abule and it's called Usi Akosa. Hello, mm -hmm. let's celebrate that. So we mm -hmm. need to talk about recent history as well when we are telling mm -hmm. stories. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, Mama. Thank you for that point, Mama. Uh, the South African Astronomical Observatory, anyway, the National Research Foundation and the universities and uh, the amateur astronomers, you know, I know Carol Botha is one of those amateur astronomers, uh, are doing their best, you know, to take astronomy to the communities, uh, running teacher workshops, doing stargazing. I know SciFest has conducted a number of events uh, taking astronomy to the communities. I remember in one year we went to Umtata and we're doing all the workshops and the communication in Tosa so that we could reach yeah. the people in the villages. So I think, mm. thank you for that, Mama. And I know you've also joined us, you know, in Cape Town, in Sutherland, where we tried even through storytelling to inspire different people. In March, 
we were there at your event in Deben, where we were celebrating the uh, the women Spirit in the of world. Light, yes, yes, where we sharing. People the are complaining. They want of, they want um, uh, Buzani to come back. We got so many phone calls. We got so many emails. When is that person from astronomy coming back? You yes. have no idea what a storm. <laughs> yes. You know, you, you you ignited here. So people want them. Um, they 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 say they, uh, you know they yes, want to mama. repeat. So we no, need to do in Durban as well. Definitely, as we go beyond the 200 years of astronomy in South Africa, we will continue to run workshops. We will continue to communicate the relevance, the beauty, and the power of astronomy with everyone. At this point, Mama, I'd like to ask our Tobisa to give a word of thanks. Wow. Now that is a very nice way to end the day, right? Storytelling is and will always be a passage of knowledge from generation to generation. Mamukdina. Oh, thank you so much from the Cyphist Africa team, from the SAAO team. We would like to thank you, Dr. Klina Mthope, as well as your organization, Klina Masigo Arts and Heritage Trust. Thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity to host you in this webinar session today. Um, please do keep inspiring us. Um, a great shout out to our viewers today. Um, please do keep in touch with us as we have just begun. Cyphist Africa launches the festival um, this month. It is a six month festival, which ends in, in March. And this month uh, we are celebrating astronomy with SAO also launching their 200 years in existence. So please um, go to our website, www.cyphistafrica.org.za. Um, also um, check our social media platforms. Um, please also do follow Mamukunam Klope to learn more about her and to get to know what she'll be doing during her birthday. Um, so now that's a wrap, um, everybody. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Please do have a very good night's sleep tonight. Kosi, hela pela ngansomi. Good night. Good night. Keep on shining. <laughs>